obviously for you, it's been quite a journey to get to where you are right now. Um, maybe we'll bring it back to when you started at Lethbridge. What was kind of, what was it like going to Lethbridge? I mean, I know you started when you were like, what, 15 or 16 around, around that age. What was it like to go to a team that was like 19 and 20 year olds there and you're just a 16 year old kid? Yeah. I mean, it was crazy. Um, you know, it's, you, you can only prepare so much for something like that. Um, you think that, you know, you're such a hot track kid growing up and then you come into a league but, you know, when you're playing against men. Um, it's, uh, it's a lot different for sure, but you know, it's, uh, I think in my opinion, the best way to, you know, develop and, you know, hopefully become a professional out of it. Yeah. yeah. What was like the, um, the biggest thing you noticed making the jump from, I guess it was, I guess it's minor hockey, um, to, to playing WHL hockey. I think just the speed of things and obviously the size, like I said, you're playing against men. So, um, yeah. you know, everyone takes everything so much more serious than in minor hockey. You know, you think that you're preparing right the right way and you think that, you know, you're doing all the right things, but in reality, <laughs> minor hockey is mostly about, you know, your, your skill and a little bit of your work ethic. But once you come to junior hockey, the details and, you know, everyone's fighting for a job basically and fighting for a spot and, hopefully to get noticed for pro hockey. So that kind of sets in pretty early. Yeah. Um, what was it like leaving the Vancouver area to go? Cause it's obviously from Vancouver to Lethbridge. It's not a, not a 30 minute drive by any means. It's probably what, like 12 or 13 hours or something like that. How tough of it yeah, was, exactly. was it to, to leave home, to go far away to play uh, junior hockey? Yeah, it was definitely tough for sure. Um, I actually moved out when I was 15. I went and played in Penticton at, the OHA, the Okanagan Hockey Academy. Mm -hmm. So it was my second year away from home. But, um, you know, it was it was a big jump. Obviously, you know, you're moving in with a family, uh, strangers uh, initially. So it's uh, that was really different. And obviously, being a, you know, a big city boy, moving to a small town out southern Alberta, it's a, it's a big yeah. jump in lifestyle change for sure. Did you grow up right in, right in downtown Vancouver? No, I'm in North Vancouver. Okay. Just, just across the water there. But still obviously a huge change from, from, from Lethbridge and everything. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. A huge change in so many ways. And obviously, I mean, looking back at those Lethbridge teams, those guys were, you guys were pretty stacked for a couple of those years. Like I know you had yourself obviously put up a lot of points and cousins, and I know you had Addison there for a bit. What, what was it like or how hard was it to kind of manage all the success that, that you guys were having was it easy to kind of just keep focused on hockey um or did you find it a bit difficult to kind of you know keep your clear path going forward as all the success is kind of coming up at such a young age yeah i mean we had such a special group there for so many years um it started off my first year um, with guys like tyler wong who's playing uh, over in the khl right now george Estevan, and all these guys who were dominant junior players and that's kind of what i stepped into so first of all learning from them and then you know, as I became the older guy, like you said, we had cousins, Addison, um, so many great players that, you know, come up and it's pretty fun to play with those guys, obviously. And I think, and, you know, when you have that kind of success, it honestly keeps you more focused because, you know, once you get a taste of success, uh, everyone wants it more and more over and over again. And, you know, with the coaching staff and the general managers and you know, even the fans. So it was like, it became an expectation. And I think that was the funnest part about it all is we knew how good we could be. <clears throat> Obviously in my, my last year, we fell short of that. So that was disappointing, but, um, you know, I, I don't think that has much to do with, you know, the kind of players we were and the kind of team we had. I think it was just things didn't work out that one time. Yeah. I mean, you see it all the time in hockey. I mean, not every time, obviously, the team with the most points wins or else Tampa Bay would have won the cup last year and so on and so forth. So it's there's a bit of, I got to imagine it's, it's a bit tough as a hockey player to like be one of the top teams in the league and, and to kind of fall up short in the playoffs. Did you, was it, I guess, what was your experience um, after the season's over to, to kind of put it in the rearview mirror and, and just look ahead to the next season? Yeah, well, I mean, it was my last year, so I didn't know that for sure. But um, so it, it was disappointing, um, you know, because we, you know, we loaded up. We got some really good players there, Jake LeCision, Nick Henry, and, you know, we made some some other moves as well. So, I mean, you know, when you load up and you have such a good team like that and, you know, such high expectations and things just, you know, didn't work out for us that year, I think that was 
really disappointing and obviously something you think about throughout the summer. Um, definitely in preparation for the next season, but I ended up uh, not coming back and moving on to pro. So yeah. um, I mean, there's so many things you can take away from that, though, just learning about how uh, it doesn't really matter what team you have on paper. And hockey such a competitive sport where, yeah, like you said, the team with the most points doesn't always come out with it. So you, know, you learn a lot from those little experiences like that. Yeah, I mean, obviously after the draft, you signed with Pittsburgh, but you went undrafted and then kind of signed with them as undrafted free agent. Uh, how bummed out were you by not getting drafted? Or did you think that maybe, like, what was kind of going through your head, I guess, throughout that whole process? Yeah, I mean, it was uh, very disappointing, obviously, like I said. And I think that, um, you know, everyone wants to be drafted. That's kind of the, the hope. And that's kind of the next step that everyone's hoping to take out of junior hockey. But Obviously, that didn't happen with me. I think it became a realization as the draft was going on to later rounds that, you know, I probably wouldn't get picked. Um, I ended up just shutting the TV off <laughs> in the later rounds and just went and went on the ice. And after I got off the ice, I got a call from my agent and said some teams were interested in inviting me to camp. So that was kind of the next step. And Pittsburgh was the first team to call, I guess. So um, they showed the most interest. But mm -hmm easy decision so yeah i went there and definitely definitely the best choice i've ever made is uh going there and i think being undrafted turned out to be the best thing i, I could ever happen to me, so yeah i mean, uh, I mean if you're gonna pick cool. a franchise to to go into the nhl it's hard to find one that's got you know better uh better cast of veterans to learn from than pittsburgh obviously with malkin and crosby and and latang and, and just all those guys there what was it like meeting all those guys and be on this I'm, I'm assuming you were on the same ice as them at some point during training camp over the past couple of years what's kind of that whole experience like being on the same ice as somebody that you grew up probably watching and idolizing to some degree yeah I mean it's a, it's a pretty crazy feeling I'll never forget the first time I was up there for the rookie tournament and Crosby actually surprised us kind of and came on the ice uh, he had NHL media day the next day, I guess. So he wanted to get on the ice with uh, a group of guys before he went off to that. And mm -hmm. I remember seeing him for the first time. <laughs> I mean, pretty shocking to see that in person. And yeah, I mean, he's such a great guy and all of them are really nice guys. So you get to know, you know, a little bit over the years, over going, going to camps with them and whatnot, but just watching all the way they prepare and their habits and stuff, you learn so much from them just being around them. So I know for you, it was, it was uh, you mentioned before, not the easiest of road. I know you had a bit of a, a freak injury that you kind of occurred. Was that just before you went over to uh, the Penguins organization? Were you still in Lethbridge at the time or was that afterwards with the, uh, the whole, like uh, the burns on your hand um, and everything? Yeah. Um, I was signed with Pittsburgh already at the time. I signed after the draft and then this was after my 18 year old season. So this was in June not this past June, but the one before. So I played my full 19 year old season after the incident right. in the Western hockey league with Lethbridge and then moved on uh, to pro this year. What was kind of immediately when that, when that injury happened, what was kind of your, your thought process? Did you have any doubt about playing hockey and stuff like that? Yeah. Um, no, originally the first day that I met with the doctor, um, uh, I was in the hospital for two weeks and, the first day, yeah, like I said, the first day I met with the doctor, he told me that uh, you know, there's a good chance I'd never play again or that I wouldn't play for at least a year. And then kind of just obviously those thoughts creep into your head a little bit. But to be honest with you, there's never doubt in my mind. I, I knew I was going to play again. I knew that. How quickly Maybe. How quickly after were you playing again? Um. I started skating a month after. Wow. Um, I wasn't supposed to necessarily. Well, I guess I shouldn't say that. It, it wasn't expected that I would. And I, I think for an athlete, expectations are different because, you know, how healthy athletes' bodies are and um, how quick you can recover from other things just from all the training and all that over the years. Um, I think expectations, and that's kind of what they, they had told me along the way. Basically, it was whatever you're comfortable with. And obviously, it was really painful physically, but I knew that I needed to be back on the ice to you know, get out of that mental fog that you, you know, kind of get into when you're in the hospital and kind of forget what you're... Yeah, didn't you have like, um, like a piece of cloth you wore under your glove for a bit as well to kind of protect your hand while playing hockey? I mean, like that's pretty... 
when you talk about sacrifices that athletes make and just having such a love for the game and, and, you know, wanting to be on the ice, that pretty much is at the top of my list for stories that I've heard. Yeah. I mean, I, so what it was, was I had these two black gloves kind of looked like biker gloves <laughs> and, um, I had to wear them 24 seven for the first, um, I think it was like four or five months, I guess I had to wear them for. Um, so they're basically just really tight mesh gloves that are supposed to keep the swelling down from, uh, the scar tissue. Um, they're really stiff though. Like you can imagine that you can't move your hands too well. Um, and then they're, because they're just there to, you know, I don't think they're expecting anyone to be playing hockey wearing those. So, cause it was, uh, it was a challenge wearing those for sure. I mean, going to an NHL camp and having gloves on your hands under your, under gloves is obviously something that's, you know, a little bit concerning and it's, it's, uh, definitely annoying, but, you know, something I had to do. And, you know, you learn a lot from experiences like that and you become grateful for, you know, being healthy again and, you know, being yourself again. So, yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. Was that something that you had to get those, those gloves? Did you have to get them cleared by, by the Pittsburgh like medical staff or was that something that you just kind of did on your own and, and it worked so you ran with it? <clears throat> yeah, I actually, I think I had to maybe get them cleared, but I think it was all good. Just like, obviously you can't fight with those on, right. you can't fight with anything on your hands. So I wasn't looking to fight anyone or anything like that. But, um, yeah, Pittsburgh was great about it. Lethbridge was great about it, helping me, you know, order different gloves and whatnot to try and make myself comfortable and trying to figure out different treatments and whatnot to, you know, help, you know, cover up some of the pain. Yeah. And like you mentioned, the whole thing about being grateful after an injury happens, like I've had that too in the past where, um, for a period of time I was training for some powerlifting meets. And so I was doing like some pretty heavy benches and squats and, and all those kind of stuff. And I ended up tearing my pectoral muscle in my right chest and I probably couldn't bench for six or seven months after that. And then it kind of gave me a whole new like perspective on what it means to be an athlete and just to, to be really grateful. And, and kind of ever since that moment, I've never taken anything for granted um, physically or mentally or whatever it may be that puts me in a position to be able to play sports. Because when you think about it, we're pretty, I mean, people in general that get the opportunity to play sports and the sport they love when they want to, they, they're really, you know, one of a select few. And when you think about the whole world population. Yeah, absolutely. Definitely. Definitely something you learn to be with this or whatever. I think that's the cool thing is you learn so much about yourself and what you're capable of after overcoming stuff like that. Yeah. Um, obviously as a hockey player, I mean, it's not only such a physical game, but a mental game as well. And, and one, you know, I, I talk a lot with younger 13 to 15 year old hockey athletes and they always, you know, they struggle with, if they make a bad play, they struggle with kind of bouncing back from it. So if they make a bad play in the first, you know, 10 minutes of the game, they kind of let it drag themselves down for the rest of the game and potentially into games that come up for you yourself. When you kind of make a mistake, you know, the first 10 minutes Mm -hmm. or the first period of a game, how do you kind of bounce back yourself? Um, so you make sure that, you know, the next play, you're not making that same mistake again, or you're not thinking about it. You're just kind of having a clear mind. Yeah, obviously it's tough. Um, you know, that's, that's one of the things you definitely start to figure out as you get older and more experienced. But, you know, when, you know, when you make a mistake, I think the best way to go about it is you, you honestly, everyone says this, but you honestly just have to forget about it. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, take a deep breath on the bench and go out. And honestly, I think the way I handle it is that when I make a mistake, I'm excited to go out and, you know, make up for it. I don't look at it as a negative way and like, Oh, I don't want to do it again. I don't, I never get afraid to make another mistake. You know, I just, I want to be able to go out there and, you know, show the boys and show the coaches that I know I might have made a mistake, but I'm ready to go uh, make up for it. I think that's the best way to go about it. Yeah. And you know how you said, like, you got to, you're, you're kind of doing it to, for your team, right? Like you, you want to show your team that you're kind of there and, and you don't want to let them down and everything. And I think that's such a, again, kind of speaking a bit about what's kind of underappreciated in sports, I think it's really underappreciated how much that team chemistry and like playing for each other matters. And I'm sure you've seen it across, you know, Lethbridge and, and, um, in the AHL and stuff like that, where when you have a close knit group of guys, it really makes that big of a difference on the ice. You kind of probably feel more confident, more comfortable. You can kind of be yourself a bit more rather than, you know, a dressing room full of 25 strangers is probably a little harder to, 
to kind of play your own game to a certain extent. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, a prime example of that is when I was 18, we traded away our captain, Giorgio Estefan, you know, our tough guy, Tanner Nagel, and our starting goalie, Stuart Skinner. We traded them to Swift Current and kind of in hopes to rebuild our, our younger group and kind of build around the guys that are on my age and you know, Cousins was uh, 16 at the time and Addison was 17. I was 18, like I said. So we kind of had a younger group that way, a younger core that we were hoping to build around. And we made some moves that were you know, there to help us in the future, not necessarily right away. But in the end, um, I think I've never been on a closer group team before. And we ended up going to game six in the Eastern Conference Finals against Swift Current, the team that we <laughs> traded all our guys away to. And, you know, we're, we're very close to, to beating them and unfortunately didn't. But I think that just shows you, you know, we're a younger team that everyone loved each other. No one was afraid of anyone. You know, we had such great chemistry and it worked out for us. And um, obviously not completely in the end, but I think that experience has helped so many guys in so many ways. So what was it like going against former teammates that you've, that you've played with? And, you know, you spend so much time with them and then your buddies and you're kind of doing everything with them. You're playing for them. And then, you know, before you know it, you're up against the ice in them and they're, you know, they're the guys you're going after. How, what was kind of your experience with that kind of, I guess it was a bit of a shift of a mindset when you have to look at somebody. Yeah, it's, it's really weird, honestly. Um, like going down on a goalie that you've gone down on so many times in practice, when you get a chance, you kind of used to their tendencies, but they're used to yours as well. So it's kind of a complete um, mind game when you're going down on that kind of stuff. And obviously, you know, going up against the centerman that you practice taking draws against in practice, um, you know, going up against a tough guy that you know what he's going to do and you know how tough he is. All these things in your mind. And I think it's, it's honestly harder to play against guys, you know, because you're thinking so much about what they're going to do, what they could do. So that kind of creeps in your mind. But like I said, with experience of it, you know, you start to learn how to get over things like that and kind of just forget about it and just remember that it's still a game and you're playing against guys who want to beat you just as bad as you want to beat them. So yeah, I think that's what it comes down to. Yeah, yeah. No, I did. I mean, a couple of years ago, probably more than a couple of years ago, me and my buddy signed for this boxing club and didn't expect to have to do this, but we ended up like having to spar against each other a couple of times. And I mean, it was harder for me at that time to kind of turn off the, like the switch of us being friends and turn into us being like competitive boxers for him. It was a lot easier to do it. So you just kick my ass all the time, but it was something that I definitely <laughs> struggle with. And I always kind of wonder, like, it's just always something that I've, I hope to achieve one day. Um, Cause it's, Again, it's, it's, it's just so weird when you think about it. I mean, boxing is a bit of an extreme example. And um, I guess in hockey, there's fights and you, you, you see guys that are friends and they are throwing the, throwing the gloves down or something. And just, um, it's just such a weird, weird part of sports, how there's, you get into situations where you're buddies with somebody for, you know, could be a year, could be five, 10 years. And all of a sudden they're the enemy. Yeah, it is a crazy dynamic for sure. I mean, it happens so many times for sure. Um, but it's something you gotta get used to. I mean, the big kind of a prime example for me. It's not in hockey, but you know, me and my brother. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, we're my brother's five years older than me, so we kind of, you know, get into some chirping and <laughs> get into the rough stuff a little bit every now and then. And it's kind of mm-hmm. weird because you know we both want to be the bigger dog, but also don't want to hurt our brother. So it's kind of an awkward situation. But I mean. <laughs> I think whoever can get over that, I mean, it's just similar to being on the ice and playing against your buddies too. So yeah, yeah. it's a crazy thing, but it happens. Yeah. I always read so many stories of pro athletes and they grow up and they usually have older siblings or siblings to a certain extent because they grow up in that environment where they're competing with their sibling all the time. Right. And it just kind of transitions to, to the sport they're playing. When you were growing up, did you and your brother kind of compete a lot, whether it was hockey or another sport or, or whatever it may be? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, Really healthy competition, of course. Um, My sister also played hockey. Um, She plays in Sweden right now. Um, She played for Clarkson University, Team Canada, under 18, and and all that. So we had a really competitive household on and off the ice. So that made for definitely made me a better competitor for sure because always wanting to one up the older siblings was something I, I was focused on every day of my life growing up. So. I think that definitely molded me into a much bigger competitor. 
Yeah, I, there's there's a famous story that uh, that I was kind of reading about the other month off the Joe Rogan podcast. He was talking about uh, John Jones, the light heavyweight champion in the UFC, and he grew up with two brothers, and both of his brothers are in the NFL, and and they're all talking about like, well, obviously this guy's going to be the greatest UFC fighter of all time. Like he's growing up with two monsters that are just you know showing him the ropes of how to compete and how to take punches, all this kind of stuff. So it's always something that I wonder. It's probably a lot of athletes, I think, don't realize how much things in their childhood that go on that shape them to be the kind of athlete they are. And a perfect example is, is siblings, right? When you're competing against siblings, you know, your whole life, it kind of gives you those early exposures to, you know, I'm sure your siblings didn't let you lose every or let you win every game you play. So you got early exposure to like what it means to lose, what it means to fail, which can only kind of help set you up when it happens when you're 16, 20, 25 years old that when you fail at something, you kind of have a bit of experience with it and you're kind of able to, to kind of handle it better. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's kind of, you know, being a younger sibling, you're always the underdog. And I think that's something you get used to. And, you know, like I said, competing against my older siblings all the time is something that I literally would consume my whole day is thinking about how I can beat them or how I can one day beat them and then competing with myself to, you know, make myself a better athlete, better player. And I think, yeah, definitely it comes with the mental side of it too. Is you're just always, you know, you kind of become obsessed with being better than them and competing with them. So I think for sure there's a direct correlation for sure. I think it's awesome. Was it just sports you guys competed with or was it other stuff like video games? Could be like stupid stuff around the house and everything. Oh, me and my brother to this day compete with everything. Golf, play NHL 20 like every day. (laughs) <laughs> we were very competitive with each other played basketball in the driveway like everything you can think of we were competitive and chirping the whole time trying to get under the other guy's skin so it uh it makes for some good entertainment what's it like kind of seeing yourself in a video game because i remember growing up uh here in hamilton and you know i guess it'd be like nhl 09 or nhl 10 or something like that and there'd be guys i went to high school with that played in the o and they would be in the game. And I think it would just be like the most unreal thing ever that I went to school with, with somebody currently is going to school with somebody that's in a video game. But it's got to be a whole different level when you <laughs> kind of see yourself in the video game. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's funny. I think it's cooler the other way around when you see someone, you know, like for me, uh, when, when I was younger, when I was in, I think I was probably still in elementary school or early high school days. My brother was in the video game for the Vancouver Giants. And I was... Uh, you know, I was so proud to see that. And I definitely, you know, seeing it over the years, I mean, when it was my turn to be in the video game, I mean, I thought it was cool, but definitely not as cool as seeing my older brother. Uh, that's for sure. Have you and your older brother had a chance to play on any, any teams together? Um, whether it's like junior or professional or even <clears> just like summer league teams out there in, uh, in Vancouver or BC? No, actually, we actually never have. Uh-huh. Um, uh, we were five years apart, so literally yeah. one year off from playing, being able to play against each other in junior. Um, and for me, I could have played against him maybe one game when I was 15 mm-hmm. um, if I signed with Lethbridge, but I hadn't decided whether I was going to go to college or play uh, in the dub yet. So mm-hmm. you know, I wasn't going to, they tried to use that one to try and get me to come play against my <laughs> brother to sign. <laughs> so. Uh, I held off on that one, unfortunately, never got the chance. But um, I mean, I don't know how that would have gone. I don't. Yeah. <laughs> could have been, could have been bad. What was your thought process or reasoning or decision making process for choosing the the WHL over? Um, I assume it was NCAA or was it um, U Sport? I guess they call it now or CIS Hockey. Uh, it was NCAA. Yeah. 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 Um, I think the biggest thing for me is uh well wanting to become a professional as fast as possible and you know in my opinion major junior is you know it's a professional lifestyle the schedule you know you play so many games you play on the road all the time all the bus trips that you do similar in the american hockey league and um i think just for me i wanted to get in at a young age and compete with the best players in my opinion in the world that were you know three, four years older than you. I think that's, I think that was the biggest thing for me. I just want to get in there, play against the best players, you know, get used to the speed, the size and whatever right away. And then 
hopefully move on to pro and the plan was to move on to pro um like I did this year um that was kind of always my dream so I mean I mean looking back as a 15 year old given that opportunity it's got to be I mean, pretty daunting I mean it's, we already talked a bit about like maybe how you know intimidating it is to be a 16 year old playing with a 20 year old but I mean to be 15 you're in like what like grade nine or even grade 10 to a certain degree and like to be in grade 10 and then going to the WHL yeah. and playing with like NHL draft picks because they could potentially you know go back for a year um, if their team sends them back down like that's got to be like I don't even know how to even answer that question if I was a 15 year old to choose whether to, to go into that or not because it would just be like such a such like a weird weird feeling and, and just such an intimidating I guess feeling is what I'm trying to get to yeah absolutely I mean it's uh it's a really big decision for your career um, you know, being a 15 year old trying to make the decision for yourself is you know, very tough, but obviously, you know, you have your agent to talk to about it, get the intel from him, what he thinks is the best career path for you. You talk to different players and different experiences, um, you know, throughout that process, I was playing, um, as an underage with the Penticton visa in their playoff run, uh, and they're in the BCHL and they had guys like Dante Fabro and Tyson Jost were both playing for them at the time. And, uh, you know, getting to hang around guys like that, you know, they're only a year older than me and they decided to go to the college route and, you know, hearing their side of why they wanted to do that and not go to junior and all that, you know, I got a good side, good point of view from a lot of different people. You know, in the end, I decided that major junior was the best decision for me and Mm -hmm. I'm glad I made that decision. Mm -hmm. And I think that's some advice I would give to any athlete, whether they're a hockey athlete or like an athlete in any sport, because it's kind of the same process and in basketball and stuff, you can go like, you can go play pro ball, say in Australia or something or in Europe or go to college, like in hockey, obviously you can play junior hockey or, or go to college is the kind of advice I would, I give to younger athletes is just consult with as many people as you know, like whether it's friends, family, people that have gone through it with you. Um, and then just consider everything they say, because everyone's got a kind of unique experience and unique viewpoint of it. And the more people that you speak to, you kind of get a better overall view of what are the pros and cons of each, uh, of each choice. Yeah, absolutely. It's one of those things where you can't just, I mean, as much as you want to follow your heart, like you do need to put your brain into it a little bit, you know, because you know, I think everyone in from Western Canada dreams of playing, you know, it's not always the right fit for everyone. Some guys go and play in junior too early and when they probably shouldn't have, and, or maybe, guys who thought they'd develop faster end up being you know, later developers and didn't end up going the right route and you know you look at so many guys that go to college you know it gives you that extra time to develop if you need it so there's so much that goes into it and you just got to be got to be sure it's the right thing for you mm-hmm. yeah man uh, last thing before we wrap up here i was interested i always kind of interested in this question but what's the one thing that you've kind of really been focused on and improving the past, say, three years. I mean, I know right now we're in a weird time where we can't train or you guys can't train um, at the rinks and stuff like that as you usually do. But over the past three, six, nine months, what's one part of your game that you've been really trying to to hone in on in practice and kind of improve on? For me, um, I'm always trying to improve my pace of play. And by pace of play, I don't necessarily mean speed or whatever. Obviously, all these different things come into it. But pace of play is, you know, your decision-making, how quick you can make decisions, how quick you see things, um, analyzing the play as fast as you can and, you know, all while moving your feet as fast as you can as well. So I think just, you know, becoming a quicker player in, in all aspects of the game. So that's something I'll always continue to work on. Is that something that you can – uh, Yeah, is that something that you um... – can practice and work on uh, off the ice or is it something that you kind of have to go through it and just keep putting yourself in different situations in a practice or, or a game? Um, I think uh, physically, obviously you're trying to get faster, you get stronger in the summer. So that obviously falls into that and working on all the different things you can to you know, get better foot speed and, you know, better conditioning and whatnot. But I think there's that side of it, but there's also, like I said, the decision-making side of it. And, um, you know, making the smarter plays faster or whatever. And I think that definitely comes with experience. Um, you know, sometimes you get comfortable, you know, playing at a certain speed and, you know, you get comfortable doing what's made you successful. But in reality, to make the jump to professional hockey, you need to push yourself outside those limits and try to make 
place quicker and, you know, doing things that, you know, will help you be successful at the next level, not just necessarily where you're at right now. Mm -hmm. So I think that's been the biggest thing for me is, you know, that the things that made me successful in junior um, weren't necessarily what made me successful, you know, in professional hockey. So that's, I'm trying to continue to work on those things that I think will make me successful now. Mm -hmm. How much are you using this kind of, I guess, stoppage of play in the season? How much ever are you using it to rest or are you just, are you still trying to like keep the same practice like schedule that you would normally have? I know you're kind of limited in the facilities and stuff you can go to, but are you looking at this more as a, like a rest and rest your body, rest your mind and, and wait for things to kind of start up again? Or are you still trying to, to work on your game every day? Um, I'm continuing to work on, I'm you know blessed to have a, you know, a bit of a home gym at, at my home here in North Vancouver and I have a, a shooting area in my basement as well. So, I obviously it's not the same, but no, I think you can try to take advantage of what you have. And I don't know what the future holds here with everything going on. So, you know, for all the season could be starting up again at some point here. So I think it's important to you know, do what you can and stay in the best shape that you possibly can and, you know, stay focused until you hear otherwise. So mm -hmm. that's what I've been doing. Mm -hmm. And I think it's pretty funny how, you know, with everyone being home, you're kind of forced to go back to the things that you, you worked on or you kind of might, might have done as a kid to improve your game. Like you said, if you got like a shoot around thing in your basement and I mean, growing up when I was uh, played hockey that I would spend, you know, hours and hours in my cousin's basement, just shooting the puck against the net and everything. And that's kind of where I learned how to play hockey was in his basement. So it's funny that now as you know, people are 20, mm -hmm. 25, 30 years old, that you're going back to the things that you did when you were five or 10 years old to, to work on your game. It's kind of funny. Like you, it brings back a lot of memories and a lot of feelings and I'm actually kind of grateful for it because I think I'll be spending a lot more time down there now throughout mm -hmm. the rest of the summer. Mm -hmm. Anyways, man, I'll wrap this up now. I appreciate you kind of taking some time uh, today to, to chat about your journey so far and kind of some of the things you do, the part of the mental side of the game. Hope you're able to kind of still work on your game, obviously, to a certain extent. And um, hopefully, I mean, for the sake of uh, whole hockey fans, all sports fans in the world. Hopefully this kind of stuff blows over soon and we can kind of get back to, to our regular schedule, regular programming and everything. Okay. No